Hello, and welcome to Resolver's sponsored webinar titled Tying Risk Management to Compensation. My name is Jacob, and I'll be the facilitator for the program today. A few notes before we begin. If you have a question for the presenters during today's session, please submit them by writing in the question box. You can submit them at any time, but we will reserve time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If we do not have enough time to answer all of the questions, we will answer them via email after the live session. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation is available underneath the handout tab. I uh, would like to turn, uh, turn today's presentation over to our speakers, uh, Jamie Cajunia, uh, Strate uh, Strategic Product Manager, uh, ERM for Resolver, uh, Brian Link, Managing Director for Mobius One, uh, Catherine Neal, Managing Director for Similar Brazi uh, Consulting Group, and Brad Tarchek, Senior Associate uh, with Tories. I'll go ahead and now turn it over to our presenters. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining Resolver's webinar. Uh, today's session is a panel discussion with three leaders who have insight into corporate compensation programs. Um, so they can help us in, in terms of um, reconciling the conflicting goals of risk and reward. On one hand, we need the right levels of compensation to attract and retain top talent, as well as being able to hit organizations' strategic goals and objectives. On the other hand, recent market events have shifted to our focus to whether an organization has appropriate risk management practices so it doesn't face any negative impact, either through reputation, regulators, or other stakeholders. So at the end of the session, we hope that you'll be armed with some information on how to start conversations with your executives on adopting great risk mitigating features into your executive compensation. So I wanted to introduce myself as moderator for today's session. I'm Jamie Gruhunia, Product Manager at Resolver. For those who haven't heard of Resolver, we are one of the few recognized risk management software on Gartner's Magic Quadrant. So this would include enterprise risk, operational risk, compliance, security, internal audit, and IT risk. So to start off, um, I'd like to uh, our panelists to introduce ourselves and tell the audience a little bit about their career and experience with performance programs. So we'll start off with Catherine, then Brian, and then Brad. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Neal, and I work with Similar Brossy Consulting Group. We are uh, a consulting firm primarily to boards of directors, but also to senior management teams on uh, executive compensation programs. So I started my career in public accounting, have a CPA, and then have been in executive compensation consulting since 2007. Um, as I mentioned, we primarily advise boards and management teams on executive pay, so that could include uh, incentive compensation design, uh, as well as factoring in risk aspects into the compensation program. Over to you, Brian. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, my name is Brian Link, I'm Managing Director of Mobius One. And Mobius One works with nonprofits and cooperatives uh, across the globe. And in the nonprofit realm, you can imagine they take on considerable of risk, a risk that often uh, you know, other folks, uh, government included, don't want to take on. So uh, risk is very inherent uh, in that business. And then uh, trying to attract people and retain people uh, in those roles where they are you know, managing organizations that are uh, taking on significant risk and associated liability at times um, can be quite a challenge. So, uh, you know, achieving that balance is, is, uh, is, is quite, uh, quite important. Um, and then prior to this role, I was a partner with Ernst & Young, um, heading up the enterprise risk management practice in the Far East area, working with large uh, governmental organizations, public companies, and so forth, and working quite a bit with audit committees and boards uh, that are tasked with not only uh, oversight of risk management, uh, but also looking at, at executive comp and how to marry those two um, uh, those two dimensions. Sometimes, you know, feeling that they're diametrically opposed, um, and trying to get that right balance. Over to you, Brad. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm an associate at Tories LLP, which is a full-service corporate law firm in Toronto. Uh, my practice focuses mainly on employment, benefits, and executive compensation law in Canada. And in terms of exec comp, uh, what we'll do is we'll help with the drafting of the plans and interpreting the provisions, as well as uh, securities filings and uh, annual disclosure requirements. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. 
So let's get into the first question. First question is to Catherine. What do most executive compensation plans incentivize? So there's a nice graphic on the screen here to outline some of the major components that uh, comprise the executive compensation program. Executives have a salary just like the rest of the employees of a company typically do. And most of the time, executives are also provided a bonus opportunity, which is based on the achievement of goals over a one year period typically. They usually also have long-term incentive uh, plans which can include, for the most part, equity-based incentives, so stock-based compensation, potentially also cash-based compensation, usually uh, vesting over a multi-year period of time, uh, typically three years, sometimes four or five. Uh, there are also benefits and perquisites, so typical benefits like other employees receive, and sometimes incremental perquisites that often have a purpose of sort of helping the executive be more effective in their role. For example, tax planning, given how busy they are, how much they work and, and how much travel they often have. And uh, those would comprise those last two categories, the paid expenses and um, the insurance bucket. And I think a lot of what we'll be talking about today really falls in the buckets of the bonus and the long-term incentive plan where those two pieces comprise uh, the incentive related components of compensation for executives where they may be mo motivated to go out and achieve certain results in order to get compensated. Excellent, Catherine. Brad, do you have any additional thoughts to add to this? No, I think that sums it up very nicely. Excellent. Um, so on that note, we have our first poll for our audience. What is the primary driver of your company's compensation plans? Excellent. So looking at the poll results, most executive compensation plans incentivize performance around revenue growth and potentially shareholder value. Catherine, this is a question for you. Does this strategy align with the organization in achieving its corporate objective? So generally I would say yes. Um, and, and when you look at the response related to revenue growth, I mean, clearly there what, what it's reflecting is but, you know, the companies that we work for or work with are in business to turn a profit. And uh, that starts certainly by selling a product or services. And in today's environment, uh, innovation is very, very important to maintain competitiveness in the marketplace in which companies are operating. So executives typically are motivated or incentivized to increase sales, to grow revenue. Um, and then the shareholder value aspect of it could be profitability. So making sure that the revenue growth that they're driving is profitable but also a return for shareholders that could be measured either through return-based performance metrics or through the stock component of their compensation. And uh, the stock component, of course, would track with the value of the company stock, which would be aligned with what shareholders are experiencing uh, and appreciating. And so if you think about it from that perspective, then certainly those are the metrics that you would expect a company would include and would use to motivate its executives to achieve its desired outcomes. Excellent. And Brian, I want you to argue the other side, why, which is why, why this doesn't align with achieving objectives. Um, well, I, I'd say it does and it doesn't. So if you sort of take the devil's advocate position and say, well, you know, how does it not align? Um, I think that's predominantly, uh, a, a, you know, sort of recasting it a bit uh, in terms of short term versus long term. Are you trying to create long term value, durable value, uh, or are you trying to, you know, hit your quarter quarterly earnings target, um, and which can, you know, uh, create some sort of you might term perverse incentives, you know, to do some things that uh, are not necessarily driving value over the long term, and and historically that's been one of the drivers that uh, that uh, you know the anecdotal uh, evidence and, and the real evidence has shown can be a bit problematic when you're managing the business quarter to quarter 
hitting your EPS targets, and um, but as in, in so doing, creating excessive risk uh, exposures. So I'd say uh, you could say no. It's really all about creating long-term value, and um, and and you really have to take that longer view, um, and which requires a different set of metrics and associated incentives. And as Catherine mentioned, you know, taking a look at, at, at uh, incentives that push the time horizon out a little bit. Um, and, uh, and and that tends to be, I think, a, a little bit more accurate, uh, you know, metric. And the, the other bit is, you know, when things go badly, um, how, how prepared is that executive management team uh, to recover from a risk of a, catastro a potentially catastrophic bit risk event, um, and you can say, well, you, you don't know until it happens. But I wouldn't say that's completely true. But I'm I, I'm sure we'll get to that in uh, a little bit further on in the discussion. Excellent, thanks, Brian. Brad, this one is for you. Um, taking to a department level, how do compensation plans vary by department? Thanks, Jamie. Well, I think uh, just taking a step back, you got to look at the main objective of incentive plans. I think one of them is to reward employees for performance. Now, since employees are going to be performing different functions within an organization, often compensation plans are going to vary by department. Uh, senior executives, when we talked about this earlier, are, their, their performance metrics are typically tied to company financial performance, such as revenue growth, like the slide one showed, um, and, and generally uh, some form of equity whereas lower level employees might instead be eligible to participate in a cash bonus or a commission plan. I think also performance metrics you know, within incentive plans can be different by department, you know, where you have, for instance, like health and safety teams metrics might reward lack of injuries and incidents in the workplace. You know, the sales teams might want to be focusing on number of sales or month to month growth in sales. So I think you know, when designing a compensation plan, it's important to determine you know, what you're trying to achieve and what performance you're trying to reward. Excellent. Thanks, Brad. So now, I guess we have talked about the executive and department level compensation. Let's turn to the risk management team themselves. Brian, can you discuss how risk executives are typically compensated and are they treated like other execs or differently? Sure. So for those organizations that have a, a dedicated risk function, um, uh, then they are, they are quite often treated as other functions within the organization. If, uh, if the responsibility for risk falls with internal audit, um, then you're going to have more involvement of the audit committee in setting that compensation, or at least at the minimum reviewing that compensation. But I would say generally speaking, um, uh, and, and again, it also varies by industry sector. So if in financial services right now, um, you know, we're still in a regulatory environment where uh, supply and demand is acting upon the risk function and, and where, uh, you know, for instance, folks that have uh, particular experience and skills around AML or ICAP or stress testing or, you know, a little bit more quantitative or legal slash compliance uh, experience, um, they're going to be better compensated because they're in demand. Uh, but then folks who are more of a, you know, generalists who are doing some very critical strategic work within an organization, heading up the risk function, um, are not necessarily viewed as, as being, you know, um, uh, requiring the same sort of compensation level, even though they have a very strategic position. And that's where I think the, the audit committee, again, needs to intervene and say, no, we want to raise the bar a bit, and uh, because this is a critical position for us as as the audit committee and, and the audit committee chair in particular, so they can say, hey, you know, I'm not going to set the compensation level for the head of the risk function, but um, risk is critical for us. We own risk, uh, at least oversight and monitoring of risk. So, um, so I think it's very, very important that they uh, they they raise the bar a bit. And I, I guess the final thing I'd add there is that. Um, you know, you also want to make sure that the, I mentioned the regulators, the financial regulators, um, what's happening now is a lot of them are being sort of captured by the uh, lobbyists and so forth. You want to make sure that those folks are compensated well. Um, and so they don't have, uh, you know, improper incentives uh, or influence to have those regulatory drivers diminished um, uh, because that's in terms of 
the health of the financial system globally, you want to have those folks on their toes. So that's the one other thing I'd, I'd mention as well. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. What about you, Catherine? Who should be approving the compensation for roles in risk auditing compliance? Should it be the CFO, their manager, and, and why? So I've, I've been surprised, I think, just uh, tagging on to what Brian was describing, I think I've been surprised to find that at most companies, folks who are overseeing risk or internal audit, for example, are compensated on the same basis, meaning in the same ways and on the same programs and against the same goals and metrics um, as their counterparts in roles over which they're sort of overseeing, if you will. Um, so I've been surprised at the extent to which I don't see a lot of differentiation in how they're rewarded. Um, there are some companies who do differentiate the pay. For example, they'll have um, a different weighting or a different mix of uh, the bonus metrics tied to, let's say, individual or department objectives relative to overall corporate financial results, where they, you might see a heavier weighting for financial results for their counterparts in other departments, but in their department, there's a swap where it's heavier weighted toward uh, their own performance. But in terms of then overseeing the actual pay and approval process for folks in those roles, I've also been surprised to find that generally it is their manager who um, proposes and approves their compensation changes, whether it's bonus payouts um, or it's changes year over year in target compensation, as opposed to having a little bit more one over one oversight of those types of things where you'd have the manager of the manager, or even in some cases, perhaps the audit committee or compensation committee of the board who might approve the pay for the chief risk officer or the, the chief auditor. Like I said, I'm surprised to find that doesn't happen more often. I think that all companies should really think hard about that issue um, and what the best governance structure is for them. It certainly feels that in um, industries where there's a high degree of risk in regulatory compliance and, and other areas that you might rethink the standard approach of just having manager approval of compensation for those types of roles and think about some other governance structure either by committee um, or by elevating it to a higher level where approvals could take place. Excellent. Brian, I, I want to come back to you. Um, can you discuss the this idea of like conflicting goals of managing the risk of the organization versus um, driving the organization forward from a, a risk team's point of view. Yeah, I, I think the risk team's responsibility um, needs to be very clear that um, the risk team doesn't, and again, I suppose to some extent it, it, it uh, depends on the industry sector, but you know, by and large, the risk team shouldn't own the risk. They're there as facilitators. They're there to ensure that um, risks are identified, assessed, reported consistently, et cetera, so that management and the board have good information by which to make decisions, informed decisions. Uh, so they're there to make sure that, fa that that risk becomes part of the fabric of the organization and that um, and that it's done efficiently and consistently and so forth. And so. So they're really there ultimately as enablers. Um, you know, I, I'm sure everyone's often heard the analogy of, you know, you have brakes in a car in some way so you can go faster. And so in a similar way, you want to, if you have good risk management practices in hand, uh, that means that ultimately the organization can actually be, you know, take on a larger uh, uh, bit of risk uh, more comfortably and, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, sometimes place those longer bets uh, with a bit more confidence because they've got you know better data uh, and data coming back quickly enough that they can respond effectively when things are, are changing. So uh, I don't know if that quite answers your question. Yeah, <laughs> that's good enough. I think I'd like to put the question to the audience um, in terms of your risk team um, value driver. So what is currently your top value driver of your risk management program? Um, with that in mind, Brad, this question is for you. 
what are the significant and common risks to consider in executive compensation? Thanks. I think, uh, you know, one of the things is setting the wrong performance metrics, and I think we alluded to this. Companies occasionally set targets which are unchecked or only included to motivate short-term gain rather than maybe focusing on the longer term and broader company goals. Um, I also think that, you know, lack of proper communication uh, is, is a risk. I think communication is one of the most important aspects with respect to exec comp. Uh, communication often takes place between a company's HR team and with other comp professionals. Uh, the executives at issue, the board, and possibly even the media and the governmental agencies. I think failure, uh, many exec comp programs can be linked to failures in the communication process. And that includes failure to obtain executive input and clearly define the performance goals, uh, changing performance standards midstream without you know, at least discussing it with your executives. Um, and then also implementing a poorly drafted compensation plan that's unclear and potentially leaves open the possibility of misinterpretation. Uh, one other risk that I see is, uh, is with respect to poor monitoring and updating of your compensation programs. A company needs to regularly review its compensation policies and plans to confirm that they actually reflect current company goals, including meeting uh, its risk of management objectives. Uh, you know, just as a company grows and evolves, so should its compensation plans and risk mitigation processes. So undertaking a review, uh, at least on an annual basis, is definitely worthwhile. Uh, so you can consider, you know, so you can identify and, and resolve any issues with your uh, comp program. Excellent. Um, Catherine, do you have any comments to add to that? I think that's, that's a great summary. Um, and I think just going back to maybe the modest debate that Brian and I were having earlier about whether the traditional metrics are really you know, the right metrics to use in incentive programs. I think another risk is, of course, that by focusing solely on those types of goals and objectives, you you miss um, a lot of the risks that may be surrounding the organization or even opportunities uh, beyond just the risks. But certainly uh, focusing solely on those and not, not keeping in mind some of the factors that are potentially capable of having a, a greater impact on your organization than even the things that you're pursuing to drive financial performance is a big risk factor. And I think that's part of what we're trying to discuss today is how might you consider where and how those types of things belong within the compensation programs. Excellent. That's a, a good segue to our next question, which is, um, what are some ways that organizations should use to mitigate any risks associated with risk compensation plans? Um, Brian, if you can start, start us off. Sure. Um, I think we've touched on a, a, a couple of these already, but um, I think at the end of the day, uh, keeping it simple, I think the, the more complex the, the, the plan gets, the, the less effective it gets. So just keeping it it's simple and relevant. Um, focusing on the long term, like we've we've spoken about before, um, you know, getting and, and keeping the board involved, um, and really focusing in on um, some of the aspects uh, that we may get into a little bit later here as well, or, and but they're a little bit harder to quantify in terms of incentive targets and so forth. And that is ensuring that the the culture of risk taking is appropriate and the right tone at the top is in place at the organization, because that's ultimately where the executives can have a massive impact upon the success of the organization from a risk perspective is by setting that proper tone at the top and establishing the appropriate culture and so forth. Um, you know, I'm going to date myself a little bit for the younger folks that are listening, but you know, if you look at Enron or some of the other uh, corporate collapses of, of days gone by, um, you know, Enron was considered world class in terms of enterprise risk management. Uh, they were the bellwether. And, um, and they had a very well compensated executive management team uh, that were being rewarded for having this world-class risk management. However, um, in terms of the tone at the top, the culture of the organization, um, it was sort of rotting from within and, and it had catastrophic outcomes as a result. Um, and so, uh, so that cultural aspect, that softer aspect is critical and, you know, just getting down in one. Oh, sorry, I sorry, I, I bumped the button there. I hit the 
uh, and having an internal audit involved to take a look at the program independently and objectively from time to time to validate uh, the compensation program, I think, is also a best practice. Excellent. Um, Catherine, do you have any examples to share with us on this topic? Yeah, one, um, a couple of examples to share. So the first that comes to mind is a good practice that I've seen some companies use where their compensation committee actually has a meeting with their risk committee uh, once a year. And the compensation committee, the purpose is the compensation committee to really be briefed on the major enterprise risks and the risk appetite of the organization. So they can get a feel for whether there's something that is significant um, significant inherent risk within the business or outside the business even that could or maybe should have some uh, role within or some impact on the compensation program. So is there such a large risk to the organization that it should be contemplated within how the pay program is designed, whether that's um, having everyone in the organization focused on how to mitigate that risk or to keep an eye on that risk. And that might include something like safety. And I think maybe we'll get into some specifics in a minute, um, but in companies where safety or compliance or quality are really paramount, um, it could be that it's important to have those types of things captured within the incentive programs. Another example would be a company I'm aware of where at the end of the year, um, they have a formula that determines their bonus program for executives, but they have the ability for the committee to make a risk adjustment to the outcome of the bonus program. And they consider whether or not uh, the company itself and the management team operated within the designated risk appetite and risk framework for the company during the year, um, thinking that if the company were able to achieve outstanding results, but in doings, but did so by way of putting the, the company at risk in ways that weren't um, part of what the approved framework were, then there might be a, a negative impact on the annual bonus score. And if the opposite were true, if the company were to deliver outstanding performance and really stayed within or at the low end of the agreed upon risk appetite or framework, that there might be some positive impact on the annual bonus program. So those are uh, two thoughts that come to mind when we think about how to capture, or how you could capture risk within the compensation program. Excellent. And, and Brad, what strategies have you seen work Sure. Well, in, a, in, a, in addition to Catherine's a, a risk adjustment to bonuses, which I think is a great idea, I think uh, you can include a cap on the amount of incentive comp that can be earned under a plan. Uh, as we've talked about, you can include provisions or vesting provisions that are based on the achievement of performance metrics that are tied to risk. Companies will often also adopt a share ownership guideline or include malice provisions in compensation plans or employment contracts that are gonna result in the forfeiture of any unvested awards or unpaid compensation in the event that an executive breaches a contract or a particular policy. Uh, you can also adopt a clawback policy. And I'd like just to take a few minutes discussing clawbacks since there's been a growing number of companies who are using them to allocate risk and share the financial loss with their executives. Um, I think the question to consider is, you know, under what conditions is it appropriate to adopt a clawback policy, which is effectively a reclaiming of pay, and how is it going to work? Uh, so I think in the U.S. you have to first look at the uh, legislation. Uh, so clawback provisions were introduced by Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, under that act, the SEC has the power to force the CEO and CFO to repay certain compensation received in the past 12 months if the company needs to restate their financials. Uh, and, and that would be a restatement due to material non-compliance and as a result of misconduct. And the misconduct itself doesn't actually need to be uh, the misconduct of the CEO or CFO. Uh, similar rules would apply to Canadian companies uh, that are listed on the U.S. stock exchanges as foreign private issuers. Uh, in 2015, the SEC also proposed uh, new rules under the Dodd-Frank and U.S. Securities Exchange Act, which contains provisions that would actually require uh, public companies to adopt a company enforced clawback policy. So these policies would generally be broader in scope than what's now required under Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, it would apply to current and former executives and would have a longer look back period of three years versus 12 years. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, and then in Canada, there are really no legal requirements to implement a clawback policy, but it is quite prevalent, uh, especially among uh, financial institutions and other large public companies. And I also think that there's uh, 
you know, general industry consensus uh, in support of the implementation of clawbacks uh, from proxy advisors and various other groups uh, like the Financial Stability Board and Institutional Shareholder Services. So, you know, what does a company have to think about when establishing a clawback policy? Uh, I mean, there's lots and lots to think about, and, and I think we could go on for quite a bit of time to discuss all the potential uh, considerations. But just, just mainly, I think, I think in order to uh, adopt the clawback policy, you have to figure out, you know, what is the objective? And it can be a number of reasons, including uh, protecting the company and shareholders' interests in the event of significant damage to the company, uh, avoiding bad optics and reducing uh, potential motivation for inappropriate actions and decisions by executives. Uh, the second point is how can the company's objective be achieved? Well, I think this is through uh, properly drafted policy, which includes an explicit set of rules and pre-established process for the board or whoever's gonna be implementing the policy to follow. Um, and the third is, you know, it goes to the implementation of the policy. Will the company be prepared to investigate and potentially penalize actions or decisions that breach uh, the policy once clear evidence of capability is uh, established? Uh, this is where having a clear and concise set of rules and steps in the policy can be really helpful. Uh, so just to wrap up the point on clawbacks, if your company doesn't have one in place now, it's, it's probably worthwhile to consider whether it would be beneficial. If you do have one, you know, perhaps it's time to consider whether it needs to be updated. Excellent. Thanks, Brad. Um, so we've talked about, you know, financial services companies, public companies. Let's put an industry lens on this. How might these practices vary by industry? And Catherine, this question is for you. Sure. Uh, they certainly do. And, and, and I would say that the practices uh, vary notably by industry where if you were to look at, for example, financial services, I think that's an obvious one where there's really been a lot of focus on, on risk and the impact that compensation has had in driving executives to potentially take excessive risk and put their companies at risk and then the overall broader economy at risk in the financial crisis. And in that case, um, that's where you really do see the regulators have stepped in and have stepped up and have actually specified certain compensation arrangements that they view to be more or less risky. So Brad mentioned earlier putting a maximum or a cap, a cap on compensation payouts under incentive programs. Um, they, the regulators generally believe financial services organizations should have lower caps on incentive payouts and that executives should not be motivated to swing for the fences, if you will, and uh, take on um, risky loans, as an example. They also don't think that stock options are a good design for uh, financial institutions because, again, there's the inherent risk that's associated with, with options where there's incredible upside potential, but really um, very little in the way of downside potential. In other industries, if you were to look at uh, the utility sector or the extractive industries where there um, would be a heavy uh, construction sort of uh, aspect to the business, you see safety metrics highly prevalent. Um, so I work with a utility company that's very, very focused on reducing uh, reducing injury rates. In some cases, I've worked with another organization where they were actually focused on reducing or eliminating and minimizing to the best extent possible fatalities. So uh, these types of organizations often do have metrics that are related to injuries within their incentive compensation programs. Uh, I have a similar experience with companies that are in um, the entertainment space. So we think of big entertainment venues or amusement parks uh, where safety and security is uh, very, very important and a focus on customer satisfaction as well because customer satisfaction and a, and a happy customer is, is ultimately gonna lead to most likely behaviors that are gonna support um, unrisky behavior within an organization as well. So those are some examples that really come to mind where you would find these measures are more prevalent than they are, let's say, in, in consumer goods, for example, where that re you really find for most, for the most part, a heavy focus on financial metrics only. Excellent, thanks, Catherine. The next question is for Brian. So besides the financial metrics we've been talking about, should compensation plans consider risk metrics when determining a bonus payout and in financial incentives? 
Um, Brian, can you discuss the pros and cons of using um, risk metrics? Sure. Uh, I think Catherine actually touched on quite a few of them just now. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at non-financial measures, um, you know anything that impacts value is is one dimension. Um, so uh, that could be quality, that could be customer satisfaction, it could be you know some uh, combination thereof. It's, again, depending on upon the industry, uh, what are those risks that may impact value that aren't necessarily you know purely um, uh, then ultimately represented in terms of financial metrics or manifest in terms of manif uh, financial metrics. Um, and then and then also looking at uh, an increasing area of interest, which is sustainability and looking at metrics around sustainability, what used to be called triple bottom line and, and now is being expanded out to say, um, you know, uh, what are the risks that we as a company are um, uh, contributing to at a macro level, environmentally, uh, uh, and, and in terms of you know the environment, in terms of uh, equity, et cetera, um, and and then also uh, again, as Catherine mentioned, uh, you know health and safety in certain industries is is critically important and and should be and is often a metric. Um, extractive industries, again, that Catherine mentioned, um, you know, perfect case in point where. Um, you know uh, it, the nature of the business is such that it's it's very very difficult uh, to avoid injury and death. Um, but but then folks will say, well, what is our risk appetite? How many people can die every year? Uh, and is that even really a question we should be asking? Because um, it shouldn't it be zero. And um, and so it's really good to have those difficult conversations early on and say. All right. These are the things that are critically important to us as an organization. That demonstrates that you know we we care about our people and our impact uh, to the environment and the community and the communities in which we operate. What are those key metrics that uh, we should be tying back? And most of them do have a risk dimension um, associated with them. Jamie, there's one I, I neglected to mention, if you don't mind, that, that Brian just when he was talking, it just reminded me of it and. It's heavily in the news and in the headlines these days. If you read about pharmaceutical companies and drug distributors and their role in the opioid crisis, but even beyond that, just the pharmaceutical industry itself and the risk that the products that they're manufacturing could damage people's health. And then there's also the risk that salespeople do things they shouldn't do um to drive sales uh, and so that one i think that's it's just it's a perfect example because we're all following what's going on with these companies and uh many of these organizations in the pharmaceutical space actually do have some kind of um quality and or compliance measure already included within the compensation program but you have to step back and wonder is it really enough? Uh, are they doing enough in that area? Could they potentially do more to make sure there's a balanced set of incentives against, of course, innovating and creating products that are going to save lives, because those are that is the mission of these types of organizations, but then being responsible in how they market and sell the products, and then also ensuring, of course, that the quality of the product is at such a such a high level and such high standard that it's not going to do damage to anyone's health and those, I, uh, I really do think, just to reiterate what I was saying, I think it's it's appropriate to step back and to reevaluate the balance of incentives to achieve all of those different objectives that I just mentioned and make sure that they are appropriately balanced. Excellent, thanks, Catherine. Um, on that note, we have another poll question. Are metrics, are risk metrics considered as part of your organization's performance plan? Brian, so this um, next question is for you. Um, I know we've talked about metrics a lot, and I see a lot of no's in here. I'm wondering if you can comment on how to potentially introduce the idea of metrics in an organization um, and from your past experiences at EY. Sure, sure. Um, and again, I, it, it really is sector specific. Um, uh, when we look at, at the quantitative metrics that are that are typically used, 
Um, you know, it's risk adjusted rate of return on capital and earnings per share and return on assets. And there's quite a list of acronyms, you know, economic value added, and it goes on and on. Um, but, um, and, the, and the most common one, in some ways the easiest one is total shareholder returns, but it's really sort of a blunt instrument because, um, you know, uh, executives can um, can influence that to some extent, but there's, you know, 40% or even half of that quite often is, is determined by the sector or the market. So um, they're being compensated both, you know, upside and downside for something that they don't really control all that much. So, uh, so I think some of the, 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 again, the financial metrics are important. Uh, they're good indicators, um, but uh, also on the qualitative side of things, or the non the non financial metrics that ultimately, you know, impact uh, the durability of the of the company and value. I think are as important, if not more important. Um, you know, where you really want to impact. Uh, the fabric of the company, the mission of the company, the long-term value of the company um, that do manifest themselves in, in financial metrics at the end of the day, but the non-financial metrics, I think, are much more powerful in terms of being those leading indicators of where the company is tracking or the organization is tracking. Because um, I think we've been talking quite a bit with uh, an assumption that we're talking about public companies, but um, you know, there are other organizations non-governmental organizations and, and others um, where shareholder value is not a metric. So then you have to say, well, what is our mission? How is it defined and how do we measure it? And what are the impacts that we're trying to achieve? Um, so again, those non-financial uh, indicators become critically important. So it, it really boils down to having a really well-defined strategy, well-defined KPIs and targets. Um, and then, um, and if you have those, which a lot of organizations don't have, but if you have those, um, then you're in a much better position to then say, okay, how do we how do we look at risk, and then how do we look at the incentives and draw out that matrix? But it really all starts with the uh, with the strategic plan and the uh, and the associated targets. Excellent. Um, and on that note, there's another poll in terms of the audience that actually measures uh, KRIs and other risk metrics. What tools do you use? So how do you currently measure and track KRIs and other risk metrics? Excellent. Um, I'd also like to talk about culture. Culture came up earlier before. Uh, I'd like to explore that a little bit more. So corporate culture does play a significant role in risk-based decision-making and ultimately the success of an organization. So Catherine, this one's for you. How can organizations measure culture and cultural risk? It's a real area of focus right now for boards. Um, in my experience, the compensation committees that I work with are rethinking their mandates a bit to broaden them out beyond just, just pay and think more about human resources overall. So becoming more of a, an HR and compensation committee than just a compensation committee. And as part of that broader mandate, wanting to oversee culture um, if you were to follow what the National Association of Corporate Directors is, is putting out and, and talking to um, their members about, it's a lot about the board's role in overseeing culture and the importance of culture in managing risk for an organization and uh, the, the external reputation of the company and the impact that ultimately then has on shareholder value. So cu culture is just certainly front and center. I have um, some companies that are a little bit ahead of the curve and thinking about, okay, how would we report to a board or even measure internally our view of our own culture? And certainly associate engagement scores are um, a method that have been used for a long time to measure the health of an organization internally. Uh, but one really interesting example I saw recently was a, a company that had done an in-depth analysis of Glassdoor ratings and comments where they looked at their own ratings and then they looked at their top uh, 10 or 12 competitors and they analyzed the ratings over time. They analyzed uh, ratings, for example, about leadership of the organization. So I believe in Glassdoor, there's, there's a specific question to rate the confidence of the leadership team and of the CEO in particular. 
And it was very interesting to see how over time the ratings evolved and changed when there were leadership changes, um, how they changed depending on what was going on with an organization. But I think um, in the end, the, the company was a bit skeptical of the information they'd get through Glassdoor and it ended up being, it ended up confirming a lot of their suspicions about their own culture and about some of their key competitors' culture. And I think was a really, really good measure, not measure per se, but a very good evaluation of their culture and places where they could improve places where they were very strong. And it even highlighted places where some of their key competitors were very strong and exceeded their ratings. So they could try to go out and learn, you know, what it is that these other organizations are doing to have such a strong culture. Um, I think they'll continue to do this. It highlighted the laggards for sure. My understanding is that some of their, their it was actually the idea of one of their investors who'd gone out and started this assessment as a way to, um, look at the portfolio of companies that they had within a particular industry and evaluate where there were strengths and where there were weaknesses. So I thought that was a very unique and very good way to try to get a, a good sense for culture that was different from what I've seen before. Excellent. And, and Brian, do you have anything to add from your experiences? Nope, I think we've lost Brian. Oh, sorry. I have to oh. <laughs> unmute myself. So sorry. Um, so uh, no, I, I I think that it it reinforces again the importance of of uh, leadership setting the tone at the top uh, as part of the uh, the corporate culture. Um, and it's not just you know their capability as managers, technical capability, but also the softer skills of setting that tone, motivating folks to do the right thing, to make the right choices. Um, and you know, you can look at things like um, you know, Catherine mentioned the opioid crisis and how that's uh, impacting some of the companies, but also um, uh, Volkswagen, uh, you know, from the senior leadership team on down, uh, you know, motivated to do some things that uh, uh, that they shouldn't have been doing that have very, very negatively impacted the company from a value perspective uh, and reputation perspective long term. So, um, you know, uh, so the question is, how do you then ensure that that the management team is up to the task of appropriately setting that, um, you know, that tone at the top, have the right moral and ethical fiber, um, as opposed to that, that diametric, you know, opposing force of, you know, growth at all costs, uh, which, you know, unfortunately, some folks, you know, are, aren't completely... Um, uh, against and uh, because it helps uh, you know drive uh, those returns and um, so th the board again I think comes out on top where um, you know they're not going to make a, there's not a huge differentiate differential in the board's pay um, you know based upon how the company does um, they are they tend to be much more independent much more objective and they're on the hook if things go wrong so they're in a perfect position to really um, up their game in terms of, of, uh, of you know, demanding the metrics that give them some sense of corporate culture. And another a harder bit of it is just walking the halls, getting out there and talking to folks at the coalface. And uh, you can do it through Glassdoor, but that tends to have a certain sort of bias to it. Um, but it's a good data point. But you know, nothing better than going around and talking to line management. And uh, you have 12 conversations with line managers, and you can learn an awful lot as a as a board member. Excellent, thanks, Brian. And we have our final poll, which is within your organization: is risk management part of the committee that decides executive compensation? Oh. On that note, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> very high, the no's. Um, on that note, do you, either Ka um, Catherine or Brad, do you want to chat about the results of this before we go into the next question? Any comments, Brad? None for me. Yeah, I, I guess I 
said, wow, and I guess I am a little bit surprised. I mean, I, I think the question was referring more to maybe internal internal committees on compensation as opposed to the board uh, committee on compensation. So the internal committees who make decisions around executive pay, it, it seems like it's something that should be raised if there's no one in risk that's involved. Uh, to me, that indicates there maybe there's some conversations that should take place about how you can bring in um, bring in a view of risk within the organization when those decisions are being made. Because I, I know boards are thinking about how to cross staff committees where you might have a member of the risk committee that also serves on the compensation committee so that you bring the viewpoints uh, of someone who's a member of the risk committee onto the compensation committee. And we, we are down to our last question, which is, um, perhaps this is for Brad. Can you share some advice on how to start conversations with executives on adopting great risk mitigating features into executive compensation? Sure. Uh, well, I don't think it's a one size fits all type answer. Uh, I think the starting point would be issue identification by the board or the compensation committee while having a look at their compensation practices. Also looking at industry trends and risk mitigation practices of the company's peers. And I think the idea would be the compensation committee or the board would then have to get management on board with any comp with any changes. And I, I think that generally starts with a conversation with the CEO and works its way down. Uh, you know, how this happens, I think, depends in large part on the company and the circumstances that are motivating the change. You know, for changes, uh, there will be a range as to how aggressive or conservative uh, you'll want to be with management. Uh, the type of company, the, the board and management dynamics, uh, I think will dictate where you land on that scale of aggressive versus conservative. Uh, for example, you know, management of a large public company uh, may be a bit more inclined to change since they may care a bit more about being a good corporate citizen. Also, I think it would probably be easier to implement a uh, you know, best-in-class risk mitigation policy if you know a big problem has been identified at the company. You know, whereas if everything is going smoothly, I think it's going to be harder to get management on board with any changes, uh, especially changes that affect their compensation uh, in, in a negative way, potentially. Uh, so in those cases, I think you can highlight to your management you know, what have your peers implemented and what the industry standard is. Uh, you know, all that is to say that you know, the strategy to be taken is very much uh, dependent on the circumstances, and you can always look to outside guidance to help navigate uh, you through the situations. Excellent. Thanks, Brad. So that um, concludes our panel session. We have a few minutes uh, before we let you go for some Q&A. We have actually one question that's come through. And so this question is, do any of you see companies leveraging risk management in the compensation of other business lines within the organization? For example, when a specific area continuously does not provide necessary information pertaining to risk functionality, HR is involved, and eventually this behavior begins to impact their end of year compensation. Maybe Catherine, you want to take that question? Oh, I think you're on mute. Apologies, is that working now? Uh, yes, I think that um, what, what's what been described there in the question is probably typically how that's handled as I, when I've seen it. So that that is that when a bonus funding is determined, usually there's a corporate funding, but then there's an allocation of bonus dollars or bonus funding to various regions or business units or departments. Um, and any business unit or area of the organization that is not doing what they should be doing um, with respect to what, what was asked in the question should most likely have an impact to their allocation of the bonus funding. Money talks, and so usually those types of uh, decisions made to reduce the funding for a group that's just not complying where they should be may be what's required to have an impact on the performance of that business unit. I mean, ultimately, you would think that senior leadership would step in at a certain point uh, and be very concerned about that type of behavior, but I agree that involving HR and then considering how you might 
make an adjustment to the incentive payout for that business unit is probably the best way to go. Excellent. Um, and that is all for our questions. So um, that concludes our webinar. I'd like to thank our esteemed guests for participating in our webinar. Feel free to reach us um, at any time. Our contact details are, I believe, in the handout. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much.